All right. Hello and welcome. Um, I hope you guys have a great conference day so far. With me here on stage is Pierangelo Di Pilato. My name is Matthias Vesenov. We both work at Red Dead and we are actually maintainers and contributors to Knative eventing as well as cloud events. And you will learn about both in this talk. Um, the title is Declarative Event Driven Application Patterns with Knative Eventing. And now let's see what we have on the agenda today. So first we do a little bit of an introduction of EDA and how that actually relates to Kubernetes or what are the options there. Then the biggest part of this presentation is that you will learn about some practical patterns, um, well-established EDA patterns implemented with Knative eventing and also making usage of the CNCF cloud event standard that is um, part of Knative eventing. And then at the end, hopefully we will have some time for question and answers. Okay, first let's take a look at the basics EDA, forgetting Kubernetes for a moment. So EDA, event-driven architectures, um, are basically a well-established thing. It's a paradigm that you find very often in solutions that uh, cater microservices. So with events, you can then trigger a microservice or your service application. Uh, and it will then either spin up in a serverless kind of uh, ecosystem whenever it's invoked or it just runs there. <laughs> um, yeah. And usually EDA systems, they come with a set of typical building blocks. The first one is the event producers, those basically generate the events. Like in our example here on the slide deck, we have um, access to like Kafka, MongoDB or whatsoever. So now from the event producer perspective, there's another interesting component that's uh, called the event router in this abstract uh, EDI principles. So the event router is basically used to ingest the events into the system and to some degree all EDI style um, components have some sort of filtering for routing. Like when a certain filter is matching, it is then actually forwarding all of the events to the particular consumers. So, and the consumers are, as they, as the name implies, they receive the events and consume them. And you can basically um, leverage the uh, incoming event payload and process that and do uh, even work with uh, return another event and then you could basically uh, trigger other microservices being involved. And the whole benefit of EDA style applications is that you have definitely a loose coupling of your microservices. You can focus on an interoperability system like you have one team that owns one service and another one is a different language uh, provided um, owned by a different team. So they are loosely coupled there. So now let's take a look at Knative Eventing. Knative Eventing actually is a Kubernetes native infrastructure piece um, <clears throat> that actually ships a lot of these building blocks that are from the established EDA patterns and that is all provided there by you. Under the covers, Knative Eventing uses the cloud event standard as the format to exchange events between the components. Are you guys familiar with the CNCF cloud events specification? Just a handful, okay. So the benefit about the cloud events is it is not really a new API. Um, for instance, talking about Kafka or HTTP, the body of the cloud event is actually the payload. And cloud event, in addition, introduces metadata, like specific headers that are defined. So. Cloud events on their own are interoperable and backwards compatible. So if you have an HTTP, HTTP cloud event, it's just some extra HTTP headers on your request. Same with Kafka. The specification, Kafka record is the data, and then you have Kafka headers as the representation of this metadata. <laughs> yeah. So we use cloud events behind the scenes. Um, our event producers are called sources. Those are declarative CRDs. We also have the option that you can run your own container and at the end of the day, these are adapters into third party systems. And then they uh, read the native format and they then ingest it to the broker API that we have. So the broker acts as the router for events <coughs> and has a trigger API. So the trigger is doing the match. Like you define criteria on cloud event um, meta attributes or, or metadata that you have, like I want to only process an uh, event that comes from source X or Y or Z. And whenever that trigger is being applied and matching, it will go to the sinks. And the sinks, any application that works as a standard deployment with a regular uh, Kubernetes service works fine here. Um, we also have building blocks 
in Knative eventing that offers like pre-configurable things. For instance, we have a Kafka thing. So the Kafka thing, when you use that, the incoming HTTP request cloud event is then persisted as a Kafka native record with the proper header sections there, as I mentioned before, in a pre-configured topic that you can declaratively set in, inside of the uh, manifest for the Kafka thing. And now we will learn a little bit about patterns. All right, so this is the list that we want to show you. Uh, some are like simpler and we want to provide some insights into them and some are like more advanced and uh, hopefully they, you will learn something new. So the first one is like that let's sync and retries. This is a pattern that you usually use for um, when a consumer could fail and usually is always the answer and um, you want to provide a, also a, an additional consumer that is going to receive an event when the consumer, the original consumer fails um, and the, the important part is that you need to think about you know how many retries we are going to, to configure the system in a way that we retry the requests that fail to be sent to the consumer and the, the particular configuration and numbers are based, of course, on the service that is, is, is receiving events and, and how long, for example, that service can stay down uh, if something fails. Uh, in this case, we have the retry number, the back-off policy and back-off delay, and as well as the data the sync, which is a reference to, in this case, another broker, but you can reference any sort of other sync or event consumer that Matthias was showing earlier. What's nice about the eventing also is that when uh, the request fails to be con consumed by a consumer, um, we also add additional cloud events adders to the event itself which is, in this case, Kinetic Error Code, Kinetic Error Data, and Kinetic Error Destination, so that um, eventually you can uh, basically get the reason why that uh, event was not received by the consumer and hopefully debug the application or uh, change the configuration. In this case, we use Kinetic Error Data is a base 64 uh, uh, value because the Cloud event specification basically has, can only contain as a value a subset of characters. So basically, for works in this case, and that's it for the first pattern. Uh, so we can check out the next one. Thank you. So the next one is uh, a very old pattern. It's actually first time mentioned in the book from Gregor Hoppe, uh, Enterprise Integration Patterns. It's like almost 21 years old book. And yeah, the benefit of this pattern is actually avoiding large payloads, which in the ecosystem of the cloud means also you will reduce your savings. The nice part here is actually, as the link underneath provides, this um, pattern is actually implemented and specified with the cloud event specification itself. So what that means, you see the attribute data ref, that's an optional extension attribute that you can have, and you point a URL. In this case, it's a web or HTTP URL. You can have also like things that mean, uh, have contextual meaning within your own organization. The benefit really here also is that if you just do not ship around the data, you may save some money, but you can also have uh, some sort of like fine grain access control because you ensure when you only send the reference, the consumer has to actually get access to the system and read the data. So this is kind of a protection mechanism built into the pattern there as well. It's not just for, for cost savings, but uh, every consumer kind of downloads the material, the data behind the firewall, so to say, and only can access the data when he really has permission to do so. The, um, this is a code snippet for a producer that sets the reference. So today, every library that's Cloud Event compliant should have some set extension where you give the name of the extension and then the value. So it will end up in a, um, in a HTTP header, for instance, or in a Kafka header, wherever you use. Um, in Java, uh, Cloud Event SDK, we have a setter for this data ref already. And for the Golang SDK, there is a proposed API that says, like, add data ref extension. 
the, ra the real difference is here, you omit the actual name of the attribute, so that's done for you by the library. And the consumption on the other side is the same, like you, you basically either get like the value of that header for the data ref, or you have some getter mechanism for the um, data ref extension attribute. Okay, next one, event transformation. Um, for this one, basically the idea is that we want to, uh, the use case for this pattern is usually when we want to provide some form of, dif a different form of the event, the original event, and transform it into a different form. Um, for, for example, in this case, we have um, an order event. In this case, it's like uh, using uh, the V1 schema, and we want to transform it to, to a V2 schema. Uh, and this is what the uh, cloud events in JSON looks like. Um, for uh, with eventing, we, we can do eventing. We can so we can specify a trigger filter on, for example, events with the V1 sk data schema and uh, point to a function that, uh, and the function looks like this one. Uh, you pretty much get an event, you transform it to a V2, and set the data schema to V2 as well, and you return it. That's all you need to do, and we handle the rest, basically. And combined with also retries, we also handle, you know, delivery failures. Um, okay, and that's the next one, sequence. Yeah, the next pattern sequence is actually a declarative component that we have in Knative um, eventing as a provided type. Um, it kind of is based on the uh, enterprise integration patterns like for the orchestration and choreography. Um, it also may be that some of you are familiar with AWS step functions. What it really allows you is uh, the sequence allows you like an in-ordered execution of a number of like services that you are doing. So on the right-hand side here, we have some um, yeah, overview of like some function or service for ordering and delivery. First of all, the sequence is like the umbrella here. Um, when it receives the event, it gives it to the order um, service. The dead letter sync and delivery guarantees that Pierangelo mentioned in the first pattern, they are also applying here. If, for instance, the event could not be delivered to that order service, you can configure um, yeah, fallback mechanisms like a dead letter sync, basically, here. So when that is all cool and uh, the event goes back to the sequence, the orchestration process then goes and it gives it to the, the next service, in this case, the delivery one here. On this slide, you see the manifest, the YAML for this one, and I made a particular difference here. The first reference is the first step, so they are in order to execute it. You see here the API version. I have mentioned here serving Knative v1, so you can use Knative serving um, CRDs there. However, Knative eventing, I mentioned that um, in the beginning, is not just required to run with Knative serving, it just works with any kind of vanilla uh, standard Kubernetes uh, v1 services. So it can be your regular application that's here. And then finally, the reply is basically the final consumer of the whole chain of um, executed functions or services here. The nice thing here is as well, you can also not just reference yet any other service here, you can also send the event back to another sequence, so you can have like from one sequence to another to another, etc. That's all really up to you. So here's a little demo. Um, so we have one source uh, that is generating an event. This is a regular text message that says, hello Paris, and that uh, uses the HTTP call to the URL of the sequence. So the sequence CRD, similar to the previous one where you saw the manifest, has uh, two functions in ordered execution, and eventually it goes to a sync. So the first function that's being seen here is a simple event transformer, <clears throat> similar to what Pianjo showed before. We see what we received. We received a message saying, hello, Paris, and it does a transformation. It appends something there. In the second function, you see whatever the first one was producing is received here, and it appends another one, like handled by the second. And then the final, just gets the entire cloud event because it was just forwarded there. So you get the transform message here um, <coughs> from the sync. 
All right, the last one. This this probably needs its own talk, but we, we are going to try our best. The outbox pattern is um, a pattern that is usually, um, at least it should be used for when a service usually is writing some records on, on a database and then eventually sends an event to a broker or something else. Usually it's very useful when you have multiple steps and you talk with different systems that are like outside your control. And uh, what's kind of uh, clear from this diagram is that like uh, these two operations are not transactional and therefore um, if for example send uh, fails for some reason the record in the database is still written to it so um, and this you know of course here we have only two operations but it can be arbitrary number of operations um, and so the, this parent is like uh, introducing a different database uh, design in a way. We have two tables. For example, in this case, we have order table and outbox table. And um, in, in, in this case, what's uh, the solution is to, in a transactional way, write in both to the order table and to uh, the outbox table. And uh, attaching change data capture system, uh, one very popular is Debezium. And um, Debezium is also integrated well with Kinetic Eventing. You can just use a, a, you can point to a broker and it's going to send events to, uh, from your database to, to a broker. And also it's ensuring that you have uh, the ordering of events is like the correct one as the service is, is writing them and also simplifies what it calls event sourcing on the consumer side. Um, hopefully this kind of give you a, an overview and if you want to learn more about uh, Kinetic eventing, cloud events or anything even driven application or building them, yeah, we are going to stay by the Kinetic kiosk or Red Hat boot and these are a few resources, Kinetic website and a few blog posts as well as GitHub repos. And yeah, uh, if you have any questions, please ask them. One note, um, I saw a bunch of you were taking pictures from the diagrams and patterns. The slides are already uploaded, however, we did some tweaks before this after this, you, we will update it, but it's already like roughly there. So you can already find it on the SCAT website whatsoever. <laughs> There's the first question. Thank you. Uh, one question I have in, in general on these patterns, the idea is the, it's far and forget. So anybody just submits this event? and for, something will happen. That's probably the idea. But how, how do you suggest to use when, for example, uh, the sender sends a malformed event, for example, we spit a, a schema on the payload, and the schema is not correct, it's missing fields. How is supposed the sender to at least know something went wrong? So in theory, um, the question, yeah, it was with the mic, it was understood. <laughs> so in theory, um, the cloud event itself also has a reference for a data schema. So if you send in proper data, the receiver endpoint should, in theory, do the validation there. However, that's currently not yet there, but that's something that would be the, the theory for, for this. Yeah, it would receive a return code error then, like it is HTTP, the Canadian event. Yeah, when he accepted and sends the wrong message, it would receive back the error code from the HTTP centers. It's HTTP applications at the end of the day. When you send an event, you send an HTTP request against the Canadian principles. The broker would not accept the request if the schema. It should be, yes. Yeah. Another question. Um, around the schema validation itself. Is that actually coming in? Because we've been looking at using um, cloud events and what have you, and schema validations off the payload itself is kind of one of the biggest, I'm not going to say headaches, but you know, challenges that, that we've still got. That's right, and uh, the, the schema validation, so to say, is currently also not really available in that sense, but it's a general theory, so this is currently not possible. But that is something that we have on our agenda that we want to do. 
you can end up also in a very nightmare situation when you have to do all of this one. Like you would potentially also need a schema registry, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, one more. Is, is the broker available if you've got VMs outside of, of Kubernetes? We've, we've got kind of a hybrid approach, you know, we've got legacy or monoliths and we've got microservices. Can, can we get access to the broker? Yeah, the broker in the cluster is an instance that has a reachable HTTP URL. So you can also expose that. For instance, if you run on, on OpenShift or something like that, you have a mecha mechanism that uh, the service, there's a service, like a Kubernetes service is, is there and you have a URL pass that points to the name of the broker with that URL and you can definitely expose your service to the outbound world. So you can install a Knative broker implementation on your cluster, exposed just at one endpoint, and you can do a curl from your machine against it with a public URL. So that just works fine, yes. Hi, uh, may I inquire that uh, for the observability tool for uh, error handling application, is there any different inside this, this pattern or all the same? Depends on the depend. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, for the observability tool, like a telemetry or log for error handling in this pattern. Yeah. What's the question? What can you do for error handling? Yeah, uh, such like uh, the message broker the break or the latency is too heavy and we need to, to improve. You mean when the broker itself has problems in processing that one? Yeah. It would return to a not ready state in the Kubernetes. You would basic, a broker is a CRD. It's, it's basically every broker that you have in the system is a CR. So it is constantly reconciled and you would see the state of the broker if that's ready or not. What we were showing here is more application specifics. Like when you send something and the broker is not able to redistribute it, it would eventually send it to a dead letter sync and it would in addition, add extra metadata, what Pierangelo showed. So then in the dead letter thing, when you fetch events from the dead letter thing, you have these extra headers and you can see why it was not delivered. But if your broker, for instance, has problems because the Kafka is going down, the broker type as a CR basically is no longer in the ready state. It would reconcile to false and you would see that as a normal, it's like any other CRD that you have in Kubernetes. If they are no longer ready, you, you have definitely mechanics to see this is something wrong there, yes. But that's more an operational aspect, not just the application specifics. Okay, cool. There's one more in the back. Okay, so uh, my question is regarding maybe not exactly about the patterns, but when I see flows of the data and the sequences, I wonder how native eventing can help me visualize or monitor the flow of the data to have a high overview of what is the data, how is the data is flowing through the system, and where are the breaking points? You want to say, Piandro? It's all on. Ah. Yeah, he, he has very insights on tracing and monitoring. I give the mic to him. So in terms of visualization, what we provide is mostly uh, every time you opt through broker, sequence, or channel, uh, we of course export uh, tracing spans. And what we suggest for visualization is using basically sending all these tracing span to any sort of integration that supports zip in format, usually open telemetry or um, uh, Jaeger, for example, and, and visualize there, you know, the flow in the system. That's, I think, the easiest. Uh, but of course, you can also technically use the, we, we haven't really built that, but you know, we don't have a UI, but technically, for example, in OpenShift, we have that part where we visualize these CRs into a topology view, pr pretty much, but it's not, you know, in the Kubernetes space, because technically as a community, we don't have expertise into UI development, you know, so maybe join us. <laughs> Any more questions? 
Okay, thank you so much. And uh, the Canadian booth is open tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, something like that, 10 o'clock. So a bunch of us will be hanging out there through the course of the week. So show up there, ask more questions. Thanks again for attending.